Hello everyone, today let's talk about designing a wide column database on top of a key value database. See, key value databases like RocksDB act like an embedded database for you. So you can use that database like a library in your application. It's not a standalone database as such, but you can use it in your application for database like features. So RocksDB particularly is a key value database and it can handle a lot of data, a lot of data. Due to the architecture of a key value database, it's also easier to distribute it among multiple nodes using key ranges. So it makes sense to implement other databases on top of these key value embeddable databases like RocksDB because they act like a storage engine for the databases that are built on top of them. So you will not need to build a completely new storage engine for that when you already have something in hand. That's why it's a very common pattern now in modern databases. For example, CockroachDB built a relational RDBMS on top of a key value database. Dgraph built a graph database on top of a key value database. So this is a very common pattern and we can really learn a lot from it. Today we will talk about Pinterest design where they built a white column database on top of the embeddable key value database, RocksDB. They wrote a blog post explaining the design and we will see some ideas from it. Today we will not be focusing on the distributed or the storage aspect of the database, but on the data modeling aspects. I have many videos on distributed systems. Let's talk about data modeling today. Pinterest wanted to unify all the key value systems they had across the company into one single database. So they created Rockstore Wide Column, which is a terrible name, but it's really cool tech. So it's a scalable, schema-less, NoSQL wide column database built on top of RocksDB. You see how many technical terms I just used in that sentence? So it better be something interesting to learn about. First, let's talk a bit about wide column database. Look at this diagram, which compares a standard RDBMS data model with a wide column database. The data is still modeled as rows and columns, but you see in a wide column database, each row can have its own set of columns. In a relational database, every row must have the same set of columns, but that's not the case here. Every row can have its own set of columns. So if row one has the columns name and speed score, row two can have the columns name and similarity score. It doesn't really matter. The schema is flexible. You know, even for a particular column, it can have multiple values under it for the same row. Cassandra, as you might know, is most probably the most popular wide column database out there. Let's talk a bit about RocksDB2 since everything is built on top of it. As I said, it's a key value database, uh, embeddable key value database, and it has a log structured merge tree index or an LSM tree index. I have already made a video on that on LSM trees. So go watch that and you will understand the index in detail. Moreover, what Pinterest did was to build a distributed version of RocksDB. They created Rocksplicator, which is a replication service for RocksDB. It makes RocksDB highly available and fault tolerant by making it distributed by replicating its data across multiple nodes. As I said earlier today, I will not be focusing much into the distributed aspects of it. We will just be focusing on data modeling. So first, let's understand the particular data model of Pinterest's Rockstore wide column database. And then we will see how that data model translates into or maps into a key value data model or RocksDB's data model. The first thing that we need to talk about is a data set, which is analogous to a table for any other database. In their database, they call a table as a data set. So you can think a data set like a table. The data set or the table is comprised with many rows. Each row must have a row key or a row ID, which will uniquely identify this row among all the rows in the data set. Now each row is constituted of many items. Each item has a column name and a list of cells. Now here is something interesting guys. Each cell not only has the value, so it does not only have the value, it also has a timestamp associated with it. So there is row, each row has a list of items. Each item has the column name and a list of cells. And each of these cells has a value and a timestamp. Now you will ask, why do we need a timestamp? Turns out it helps us to do a lot of interesting things. The first thing it brings us is the history of a value or multiple versions of the same value. Let's say you want to know how a value has changed over the last one hour or one day. 
you can use this feature to track the change in the value. This is great for analytical purposes. Instead of updating a value in a cell, it can add a new cell with the latest timestamp. You can also support time range queries where you can give time bounds or start time and an end time and it will return values only within that time bounds. Now the question is, if we want to hold all these versions of all these values, won't it take up too much space? That's why they have a setting called TTL or time to live on each data set. The TTL defines the time after which a value in a cell is expired or a cell is expired. So let's say it's one day for a particular data set. After one day, those cells will not be usable. So if you query on that data set, you will not even see those rows. Those cells will be ignored, which are expired. They have a process called daily compaction, which runs daily and it removes, it deletes all the expired values that they have. It deletes all the expired cells that they have. Now that we know all this, let's model all this on top of RocksDB in a key value format. Now what I'm going to show you is a very common pattern that is used by multiple other databases as well to map other paradigms into a key value format. So if this is the white column data set called user and you can see the data and the columns it has, we will need to create a key to store each of these values, each of these cells in the key value database RocksDB. Now how will we create those keys to uniquely identify a value in the key value database? We will use something like this. We will take the row key and then concatenate it with the column name of the value and then concatenate it with the timestamp of the value. So now it will uniquely identify the value row key plus the column name plus the timestamp, right? It creates a string key that we will put in our key value database and corresponding to that, we will put our value. At this point, we need to know something important about RocksDB. The index it has, the LSM entry index, stores all the keys in ascending order on the disk. This is actually very beneficial for us since the data for each row and the data for each column would be sequential. It will be one after the other. It will be together since all the data is sorted. So we can access the data of each row and access the data of each column together very easily. There is only one problem now. You see, most of the times we will need the latest data or the data from the latest timestamp. But since the timestamp is part of the key, it will be started in ascending order by RocksDB. Something needs to be done about it. We need the latest timestamp up top. So what Pinterest did was to create a custom comparator, which would store the key in ascending order according to the rest of the key. But when it comes to the timestamp, it would sort it in descending order. So in this example, you can see three score, which is for row ID three and column score. After that, the timestamps would be sorted in the descending order. So considering everything is the same, except the timestamp, the keys would be descending order. Otherwise it will always be in ascending order. Now let's see how we can do some operations on this database using RocksDB. The first operation we want to do is get rows, which would get one or more rows from the data set. Now to get a particular row, you will have to supply the row key, which identifies the row. And of course you will have to supply the data set when you're working with the database. So let's say if someone wants to access all the values for row key one, how will we go about it? See, RocksDB can do a very efficient prefix search. Since all the keys in the RocksDB key value store is sorted, we can do a very efficient prefix search. This means it will give RocksDB a prefix and it will return you all the keys and the values that starts with the prefix or whose keys start with that prefix. It can do this very efficiently, very fast. So for row ID one, all its values will have keys starting with one. So we can do a prefix search with one. So it will return all the values and all the keys from row with row key one. If more information is given to us, let's say like the column name, we can do a prefix search with the row ID plus the column name, and then it will give us data from that column only. And it can do it very efficiently, as I said, using prefix search. Let's say even the timestamp is given to us, then we can take the row ID, we can take the given column name, and we can take the given timestamp and do a full key search on RocksDB. It will do it very efficiently and we will get that particular value for that particular row, for the particular column and that particular timestamp. Even if a time range is given to you, you can efficiently and easily filter out the required data since the timestamp is sorted. One more good thing that we can support when getting rows is pagination. 
if a lot of rows is requested we can return only a particular number of rows at once instead of returning everything at once so let's say there are 400 rows that are requested we can send 100 at once and then send a marker along with it this marker will identify from where to start reading the data for the next request so what the client will do when it receives the first 100 rows it will take it it will process it or do whatever it wants and then send a request back to the database along with that marker then it will send the next 100 then again it will send the marker then it will send the next 100 so it will happen four times and we will get all our data now deleting values given a row id or given a row id and a column name shouldn't be difficult think about it we can use the same method to identify the keys as we did for gate rows using prefix searches and full key searches and then we can delete those keys from RocksDB. Adding a row with some values would also be pretty simple. We would just create keys for the values that will be entered. We know how to create keys for the values given to us and RocksDB would take care of properly sorting this data and storing this data. Let's say we also want to add a new value in a particular row under a particular column and give it a new timestamp. So basically we want to add a new cell simple we would create a key for that new cell and we know how to create keys and we will put it in rocks tv key value store a great thing that pinterest did in their blog was to highlight a particular use case on how they use this database to solve a real life problem so what's the problem see pinterest's users do a lot of activities throughout the day so they would search something, they would pin something, they would drip in something, they would comment on something. They needed a way to store all these actions from each user and then do analytics on them efficiently. Now this is a large scale use case and it will be interesting to know how they did it. Okay, here's the data model and it's pretty simple. To identify each row, we need a row key and in this case, the row key is the user ID. So each row will be representing a user. Each column is the action type. So let's say searches, spins, repins, all these things are columns in the table. Now, when a user does an action, let's say a user pinned something, it would be stored under that user's row, under that action column with a new timestamp. So you see the data is stored for each user, for each action type across time. So they can do analytics across time with all this data that they have. So how will they query this data? They will give the user ID, which is the row key, and then they will give the action type, which is the column name, and they would also give the number of values that they want. So then the database will return the values that are there for that particular user, for that particular action, and only the number of values that are requested in the descending order of timestamp. Now they also have some more important features like they can use the snapshot feature in RocksDB and take a backup of that snapshot on something like AWS S3. This gives them much more confidence in the reliability. Having a database without backups at that scale is super scary no matter how reliable the database is. Make sure to read the blog that Pinterest wrote. I will link it in the description. Well, this was all for today. I will see you in the next one.